welcome everyone for coming out tonight um, to celebrate our dedication for our Booker T. Washington mural. Um, as I said, but you might not have heard me, I'm Lena Melendez, the Church Council Moderator of Pilgrim United Church of Christ. We're really thankful that you came out to celebrate tonight. I have a list of individuals and groups that I want to give special thanks to. Um, first, our grant funders, um, the New Bedford Counts Cultural Council. Also, we received a Wicked Cool Place grant from the New Bedford Creative and New Bedford Economic Development Council. Thank you to them. Also, thank you to the Pilgrim United Church of Christ Women's Club for their donations. And special thanks to the Sherman family for many contributions and fundraisers and yard sales that they held. I would also like to thank Fernandez Masonry for putting the mural up. And special thanks to several church members for all of their assistance throughout this process, including Andrew Jones and Michelle DeMary. And now I would like to introduce our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Donnie Anderson. Uh, thanks, Lita. We are so excited tonight and so glad that you are here to help us celebrate this very special day. You will hear a little later on about how a member of our congregation discovered that Booker T. Washington had actually been in this building in 1895 and wanted to commemorate that in a certain way and how that all unfolded. You'll learn about that before it's over. We're all going to try to move along because we realize that Mother Nature is kind of closing in on us, but um, we really want to be outside to celebrate this uh, marvelous uh, mural and what's here. We're going to have a prayer of dedication uh, and then we're going to welcome some public officials and then well, we'll move on talk a little bit about the lady who really initiated this and we have a wonderful little dialogue uh, that's going to go on between uh, Elliot and Michelle and then finally Shane Burgo is going to uh, sing. I think I oh and we're going to talk a little bit about the lady. Yes, okay. I think I got that. I'm going from memory. Terrible thing to do with me. Anyway, um, folks this mural for us as a congregation is not just about putting up a mural. We did our best to include the community in conversations about this. We invited a local artist to paint this and create this wonderful piece of art because we want this to be a statement about our commitment to this community. We care about this community. We're glad to be here. And we hope this is just the start of even more kinds of creative things that we can do to be interactive and part of this community. We are so grateful for the city of New Bedford and for the fact that we get to be right here and be the church right here. So I'm going to offer a prayer of dedication for this mural. Let's pray together. Gracious and holy God, you have called us all from various parts of the planet Earth to live in this space. And we are so grateful for the history of New Bedford, for the way in which before the Civil War, New Bedford was such a center for anti-slavery. And then for the work that took place during Reconstruction in that part of history that so many know so little about but that this particular visit was a big part of. So we are grateful for this city and for its history. But more than that, we are grateful that right here and now, this is a place where good things are happening. And we enter into the future with a great sense of, sense of optimism because we trust you and because we love the people in this community. We ask your blessing upon this mural, that it will be a reminder to all of us every time we see it of what is possible when one person decides that they're going to make themselves available for the world to be a different place. Thank you, O oh God, and bless this mural, we pray. Amen. Amen. We want to uh, be very thankful. I don't know, is Lee Blake here? I didn't see her, but she was going to come. I want to thank her. I uh, certainly want to thank uh, Margot 
Margot, I'm going to butcher this, Sonier? That's right. I did it, right. Yeah, because we are so grateful for the funding that came from the New Bedford uh, Creative Council. So I'm going to invite our mayor, John Mitchell, to come forward uh, for comments. Mayor? All right, hello everybody. Happy AHA night, good to see everyone. So yes, uh, after that rainstorm a couple of days ago and with threats of something similar, uh, somewhere, somewhere soon, where we're um, sometime soon, uh, I'm gonna make it brief, but um, I, I just, this is really cool. Um, and it's cool in a, in a number of ways. And um, uh, I, I just want to share a couple of observations uh, with you and why I think it's cool. Um, and, and Donnie, you know, you, you hit on this a moment ago. Um, you know, New Bedford is a place that is different. Uh, I was recently, I think some of you may have seen this, what is a pretty well followed, um, uh, blogger on Urban America who did his uh, top 10 uh, most distinct small cities. We don't consider ourselves a small city. We're over 100,000 means we're a medium-sized city, but we, we're okay with uh, Under the circumstances, it was okay. 10 most distinct uh, cities in the United States, and this was, a, this was about three or four months ago. And, you know, every, all the other nine uh, were college towns, places like Ann Arbor and Charlottesville. Uh, we were the only one that wasn't a college town of sorts, and it's just, in a, in a, just to cut to, to the chase, what makes New Bedford different is that its story is just so different, and it's that distinctiveness, the distinctiveness of a place that was founded with the highest egalitarian ideals by a bunch of Quakers who were re religiously um, uh, passionate, but also uh, were good businessmen and uh, were able to found a place that thrived but also was committed to equality. And that it really has played out as a through line throughout our history, um, though not perfectly, we will all hasten to add, but a place that continues to reassert itself. And I think this is uh, reassert its, its core values. This is one of those occasions where you have here, and I, I frankly I have to confess, I wasn't, I'd like to consider myself to be a New Bedford history buff. But I didn't realize that Booker T. Washington uh, had visited uh, New Bedford, so we dug into it a little bit. This was, it, it, there was a lot to be said here, right? So this is the time in 1895, Plessy uh, versus Ferguson would be decided the next year, uh, which, in which this, one of the most odious decisions of the Supreme Court, which enshrined um, separate but equal for the next 50 years, 60 years and a uh, time when um, there was, it, we're in the midst of just post-reconstruction. Reconstruction had ended less than 20 years before. And the nation was struggling to, um, you know, to, to, to figure out a, a way forward. New Bedford already had the way forward. There was a reason why someone as illustrious as Booker T. Washington would come here. And that's not just because this is a place where that had wealth and could make donations to the cause, but it was also a place that got it, that a place where he could find kindred spirits. One of those kindred spirits uh, on the on the dais that night was none other than our very own uh, Sergeant William Kearney, of course, uh, the first African-American to be awarded the Medal of Honor and someone that we're all so proud of. Um, but it, it was at, on that occasion where he gave this speech because uh, to raise funds for the Tuskegee Institute, who, which was dedicated at its inception to racial equality. And so, you know, our connection to that is, is again, when you, when you start to sort of sketch all these, all these, these lines, these connections of New Bedford through, they're all in, in many ways so positive, so, so um, loudly speaking to uh, our highest values. And, and, uh, and so I just wanted to say, Thank you for um, for being here to proclaim this. Uh, there was a lot of work put into it. Donnie, thank you for hosting. Margot Salne, of course, uh, our creative coordinator for the city, who does just such a fabulous job pulling these kinds of things together. Um, and, and so many others of you uh, here who played a role in it. I do want to give a special shout out to Eden Soares. I don't know why you're in the back, man, because you're, the, you're just... Um, I know why you're in the back, because you're that kind of guy. You're not, you, don't, you don't do it for the limelight, but um, 
you know, the, the mural that uh, we all un unveiled last year, your, another, your, your other, most, your most recent masterpiece right out of Cushman Avenue, just a few blocks from here is another example of uh, the kind of gifts that you're giving our city. And I just want to say, my friend, uh, you're, I wish I had your talent, but I also think I'm glad you're on our side. I'm glad you're applying your talents here. So thank you for, for, for this. And um, you know, look, this is just another reason to be proud to live here. And um, we'll get rid of the graffiti, just call DPI. We'll uh, <laughs> do a little bit of a facelift here. We'll work on that too. But you know, thanks everybody for being part of this. And I, I wanted to give uh, acknowledge that the elected officials in the audience, Tony um, and Shane Burgo, and I don't know if anybody else is here, but are all big supporters of, of these kinds of works, and they have been uh, all along. So thanks everybody for coming out and, and being part of this today. And we're going to, uh, we are going to hear from um, Eden in just a few minutes. So uh, you're going to really get a chance to hear from uh, the artists. But I want to ask Representative Cabral to come up and to just make a couple of comments. Tony, please come up. Well, good afternoon. Uh, also, uh, Steve here from Representative Hendricks' office. Um, he could not join us this afternoon due to a family issue. But this is really, as the mayor pointed out, and as he is a history buff of New Bedford, obviously this is a great opportunity and a great occasion for us to celebrate such an illustrious citizen of, of the United States that visited New Bedford in 1895. It really tells you something not only about him, but tells a whole lot about us in New Bedford. You know? Our history, our commitment to equality, and as the mayor said, hasn't been perfect all the time but I think we keep working to make it perfect. And I think someday we're gonna reach there and we're gonna get there. But it's important to remember uh, special occasions and how important this city has been in the right side of history and the right side of equal rights and in the right side of, of making, uh, changing this country and changing the state and changing our, our region for the better. I think we have a, a rich history uh, when it comes to that and also shows that the people of this city throughout its history has given to the, those important causes. As you know, in 1895, New Bedford was a pretty wealthy place, right? It's a place that you could see and, and give back and, and the citizens of this city did give back. So we continue doing that. It's nice to see so many of you here who care so much about this city and care about our history and care about working together to make this place not only a better place for us, but for our children and our grandchildren. And we keep working at it every day, and I think we're getting better uh, every day at it as well. And I think uh, the city has come a long way in making and recognizing uh, the hi its history and how rich it is, and how rich it is in terms of all those folks and all those families that live in the city, regardless of their background and their um, ethnicity or race. It's important that we come together and celebrate all of our good things uh, and work on the bad things together as well. But this is a great day. This is a great moment. I want to congratulate uh, uh, Reverend Anderson and, and the, this congregation uh, to really uh, um, to really come together and, and make this happen. So thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate any words of congratulations. The reality is I've only been here a little over two years, and this project started long before I got here. And it was started by this woman, Alice Sherman, uh, who many of you know as a significant member of this community. We're gonna ask one of her daughters to come forward and to talk just a little bit about her, and also to thank the person who really took Alice's inspiration and brought it to fruition. So, Nancy, where are you? Oh, there you are. Nancy Green. Hello, everyone. Several years ago, Alice Sherman, my mother, a 65 plus year member of this church, Pilgrim United Church of Christ, began a quest 
to have this mural painted and placed on this building, our church home. She had discovered in the church a copy of Pilgrim's Progress, the church newspaper, which identified that Booker T. Washington spoke here in this building in 1895. Having seen some of the beautiful murals that were going up around the city, she became determined that this mural, mural would be created as it speaks to the history of this church in this city. It became a mission that would continue for the rest of her life. She was passionate, resolute, and extremely vocal. <laughs> At many monthly church council meetings, she raised the issue and asked, how can we get this done? How can we raise the money? Are there grants available? Where can we find an artist? She never gave up, nor would she take no for an answer. Alice passed away two years ago at the age of 90, but without question is smiling down on this day. She was a true champion of the city of New Bedford and she loved this church. So to see this project come to fruition is wonderful and a true blessing. There will be many people and organizations thanks, thank today as they have been for their role in seeing this project completed from the incredible artist Eden Soares to the many who were responsible for donating and raising the funds for the project. But no one deserves more thanks than Michelle DeMary, who worked tirelessly. Where is Michelle? Who worked tirelessly writing grants, making all the necessary contact, contacts, and never giving up on this mission. The Sherman family and Pilgrim United Church of Christ are forever grateful for her, especially Alice. The city of New Bedford and its present and future citizens will continue to benefit from this project and remember the important role the city played in civil rights and education. It is now my pleasure to introduce the extremely gifted artist Eden Soares whose vision for this project exemplifies who Booker T. Washington was. <laughs> I'm honored here today to be a part of this amazing project. Like many of you, I had no idea that this courageous and strong leader spoke right here at the United Pilgrim Church. Booker T. Washington was born a slave on a Virginia plantation in 1856. At a young age, he was allowed to go to school, which he had to walk many miles away to attend and still hurry back to do his work as a servant. This was how he learned to read and write. In 1872, he befriended the founder of Hampton Institute who offered him a scholarship to his school. Washington taught at Hampton Institute before being appointed by General Samuel Armstrong to head the newly formed institute in Tuskegee in Alabama in 1881. Booker T. Washington showed his students and the world that starting from a very difficult circumstance, he was able to rise above and become the most influential an empowering intellectual of our time. And I'm so honored to be a part of this project. And first I wanna thank, of course, the late Alice Sherman for having the idea or the concept of highlighting Mr. Booker T. Washington. I also wanna give a special thanks to Margot Saulnier for recommending me into this historical project. And I want to thank, also want to thank uh, Reverend Dr. Donnie Anderson and Michelle Damari for being patient with me and so understanding as I was recovering from surgery um, that happened kind of midway into this project. But I'm so honored and so proud to be, to have work on this mural for, for Booker T. Washington. And to everyone who came out to show their support, I truly thank you.
have to admit, the only reason this got done is because I knew Alice would haunt me forever if we did not finish this. So, no haunting, Alice. <laughs> Good afternoon. We have taken a few excerpts from Mr. Booker T. Washington's well-known autobiography, Up From Slavery, to give a little sense of the man depicted in this mural and about which you've heard a little bit from the mayor and from Eden. Written in 1901, the book portrays his early life, his years of schooling in West Virginia at the Hampton Institute, now Hampton University, and on to his time as the storied first president of Tuskegee Institute in Tuskegee, Alabama. A big thanks to Mr. Elliot Talley who will read the excerpts. I'll fill in between with some context for his readings. Please note that this was written in 1905 when terms such as colored and Negro were acceptable in describing African Americans. We have opted to keep Mr. Washington's own words. Thank you. I was born a slave on a plantation in Franklin County, Virginia. I am not quite sure of the exact place or exact date of my birth, but at any rate, I suspect I must have been born somewhere and at some time. <laughs> The earliest impressions I can now recall are of the plantation and the slave quarters, the latter being the part of the plantation where the slaves had their cabins. And so begins Up From Slavery, the autobiography of Mr. Booker T. Washington, the man we honor this evening. A widely known and respected black leader in post-Civil War America, he was born on the eve of the Civil War. Today, he is perhaps best known for his work to bring education to black Americans in the South who had only recently been freed from slavery. It was this work that brought him north many times to raise money for southern black schools, especially the school where he served as the founding president, Tuskegee Institute, where he began his work in 1881. It was this work which brought him to New Bedford in 1895 on a fundraising tour for Tuskegee. He gave one of his talks in this very building. However, his passion for education began much earlier in his life. I had no schooling, whatever, while I was a slave. Though I remember on several occasions, I went as far as the schoolhouse door with one of my young mistresses to carry her books. The picture of several dozen boys and girls in a schoolroom engaged in study made a deep impression upon me. And I had the feeling that to get into a schoolhouse and study in this way would be about the same as getting into paradise. At the end of the Civil War, Washington moved to Walden, Malden, West Virginia with his mother, stepfather, and his brother John, where his stepfather could work in the salt mines and the coal mines. Washington, too, worked in the mines, but never stopped pining for an education. From the time that I can remember having any thoughts about anything, I recall that I had an intense longing to learn to read. I determined when quite a small child that if I accomplished nothing else in life, I would in some way get enough education to enable me to read common books and newspapers. Soon after we got settled in some manner in our new cabin in West Virginia, I induced my mother to get hold of a book for me. How or where she got it, I do not know, but in some way she procured an old copy of Webster's blue back spelling book, which contained the alphabet. So I tried in all the ways I could think of to learn it, all of course without a teacher, for I could find no one to teach me. At the time, there was not a single member of my race anywhere near us who could read, and I was too timid to approach any of the white people. In some way, within a few weeks, I mastered the greater portion of the alphabet. In rereading Mr. Washington's autobiography in preparation for today's celebration, I was struck again and again how much drive it took for him to get where he did and how privileged I have been not to have, or have to work nearly as hard. One day, while at work in the coal mine, I happened to overhear two miners talking about a great school for colored people somewhere in Virginia. This was the first time that I had ever heard anything about any kind of school or college that was more pretentious than the little colored school in our town. As they went on describing the school, it seemed to me that it must be the greatest place on earth and not even heaven presented more attractions for me at that time than did the Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute in Virginia, about which these men were talking. I resolved at once to go to that school, although I had no idea where it was, how many miles away, or how I was going to reach it, I remembered only that I was on fire constantly with one ambition, and that was to go to Hampton. This thought was with me day and night. 
Mr. Washington did make it to Hampton. Although he struggled continuously to fund his studies, he succeeded. We here in New Bedford should be happy to know that one of our residents played some role in his success at Hampton. I was determined from the first to make my work as janitor so valuable that my services would be indispensable. This I succeeded in doing to such an extent that I was soon informed that I would be allowed the full cost of my board in return for my work. The cost of tuition was $70 per year. This, of course, was wholly beyond my ability to provide. If I had been compelled to pay for tuition in addition to providing for my board, I would never have been compelled to leave the Hampton School. General Armstrong, however, very kindly got Mr. S. Griffiths Morgan of New Bedford, Massachusetts to defray the cost of my tuition during the whole time that I was at Hampton. After I finished the course at Hampton and had entered upon my life work at Tuskegee, I had the pleasure of visiting Mr. Morgan several times. Today, Tuskegee University is a widely respected institute of higher education, offering 68 degree granting programs to approximately 300 students each year. It has an endowment of $127 million and is located on acres of land with dozens of buildings. It didn't start that way, however. What were we to do? We had only the little shanty and the abandoned church which the good colored people of the town of Tuskegee had kindly loaned us for the accommodation of the classes. The number of students was increasing daily. The more we saw of them, the more we traveled through the country districts. The more we saw that our efforts were reaching, to only a partial degree, the actual needs of the people whom we wanted to lift up through the medium of the students whom we should educate and send out as leaders. While being remembered as an educator and leader, Mr. Washington also became, by necessity, a prolific fundraiser for his institute. After that kindly introduction, I began going north alone to secure funds. During the last 15 years, I have been compelled to spend a large portion of my time away from the school in an effort to secure money to provide for the growing needs of the institution. And it was on one of these trips, as we now know, that Mr. Washington made his way to New Bedford to speak here what was then the Trinitarian Church, which later became Pilgrim United Church of Christ, on one of his fundraising trips in 1895. The burden of raising funds fell on him not only because he cared deeply about Tuskegee and the education of its students, but also because he recognized that he was heading an experiment. Bear in mind that he's writing about his thoughts less than 20 years after the Civil War had ended. I recall that night after night, I would roll and toss on my bed without sleep because of the anxiety and uncertainty which we were in regarding money. I knew that, in a large degree, we were trying an experiment, that of testing whether or not it was possible for Negroes to build up and control the affairs of a large educational institution. I knew that if we failed, it would injure the whole race. I knew that the presumption was against us. I know that in the case of white people beginning such an enterprise, it would be taken for granted that they were going to succeed. But in our case, I felt that people would be surprised if we succeeded. All this made a burden which pressed down on us, sometimes it seemed at the rate of a thousand pounds to the square inch. A man of vision, passion, and dedication to improving conditions for people of his race, it is perhaps the combined weight of his worries and his work that led to Mr. Washington's dying in 1915 at only 59 years of age from high blood pressure. Due to his efforts, thousands of students have received an education at Tuskegee. He has left behind many books, not the least of which is the autobiography from which these quotes were taken. Throughout the book are sprinkled words like those that Mr. Eaton Soares chose for our mural, with which we honor this great man today. Allow us to leave you with one more piece of wisdom from Mr. Washington. From General Armstrong's example, I learned the lessons that great men cultivate love and that only little men cherish a spirit of hatred. I learned that assistance given to the weak makes the one who gives strong and that oppression of the unfortunate makes ones weak. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, both of you. Thank you both so much. Let's just thank them again, right? That is so great. Uh, we have one more thing, and then we're, we are done. 
Um, after the program, we invite you to come around the corner and uh, into the door into our church home. We have refreshments for everyone, and we'd like to invite you to come and enjoy that. And uh, for those of you who some of us may not know, we'd love to get to know you as well. Um, for some of you, the civil rights movement of the 60s is something you read about in history class. For some of us here, it was part of our lived experience. As a college student in the 1960s, it was part of my lived experience as well. I think that there is no song for me that more epitomizes the hope that we felt at that time than Sam Cooke's A Change Is Gonna Come. Council person uh, Shane Burgo is gonna come and sing for us. Shane, and then when we're done, when he's done, we're done, okay? Thank you, Reverend Anderson. Uh, I just first want to obviously bring greetings on behalf of the New Bedford City Council. You know, as I walk up and I look at the city seal, I'm reminded of our city motto, Lucem Defundo, which translates to I diffuse light. So when we think of the Alice Shermans, the Margos, the Edens of our community, knowing that they're using uh, their light to diffuse throughout our city is so important. And that's why I love coming to these mural unveilings. So if we could hear for them one more time. Yeah. It's so important to have that here in New Bedford, and we are very blessed. <clears throat> I was born by the river in a little tent. Oh, and just like that river, I've been running ever since. It's been a long, a long time coming. But I know a change gon' come. Oh, yes, it will. It's been too hard living, but I'm afraid to die. Cause I don't know what's up there beyond the sky. It's been a long a long time coming, but I know a change is gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. I go to the movies and I go downtown. Somebody keep telling me don't hang around. It's been a long a long time coming, but I know oh, a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. Then I go to my, my brother, and I say, brother, help me, please. But he winds up, winds up knocking me back down on my knees oh there's been times when i thought i couldn't last too long but now i think i'm able to carry on it's been a long a long time coming but i know a change a change is gonna come oh yes it will thank you All right. <laughs>